he told me that he was very depressed and he said that each day with my mother was pretty much the worst day of his life versus the day before. Like he, every day was the worst day of his life. Chris, did you have anything to do with the murder of your father? No. Welcome back to Court TV Live. Perfect timing. They are just getting underway in the state of Georgia, which is that soundbite from Chris Ferris. Well, Scott Ferris is going to be back on the stand here. The cross-examination of the son of the defendant about to begin. Let's head into the courtroom. Tried your dad's office, those two doors, what I call the American doors and the French door on the back side. Is that right? Yes. And then if you walked out uh, those doors and turned left, is that you're walking to the burn pile? Yes, you will be. And this, this is Ariel 8. Now, do you know, can you give us an estimate how far is it, the burn pile from the kind of the edge of the house? How far a walk is that? I would probably say maybe 70 to 80 yards, give or take. And is there, what is the path, like the RTVs and the tractors? You said your dad would grade or rake around the, the burn pile? Or would he use hmm. the tractor to put stuff on the burn pile? He would use the tractor to put stuff on the burn pile and uh, couldn't really rake with it because it's such a you know, steep uh, incline. Right. It'd just be hard to maneuver is there the a, tractor. Is there a path that's been made from the RTV or the tractor in, in that area of the woods? Yes, yeah, so there was a path that you could go from the driveway behind the house and go all the way around to be able to gain access to the, you know, the dam on the pond or go back there where the burn pile was. When you look at aerial A, this photograph, so if you come up the driveway into the garage, I think y'all had chickens and birds on a chicken coop over here. Yes, it was connected to the shed. And then down by the barn where there's some other areas for birds or whatnot? Yeah, we had another chicken coop up there. Okay, so two chicken coops on the house, on the property? Yes. But you go to get there with like a tractor RTV, would you go around, would you go to the left of the chicken coop or in between the chicken coop and the house? You would go to the left of it. Is this a chicken coop? This is Thrasher 61. Is this what we're talking about? You come to the left side of that? Yes, sir. So this time I'm tutoring to Evans, uh, which is, we've labeled as S. Ferris 11. It's a blown up photograph from a pin board. All right. Any objection? No objection. Judge, with your provision, I'd like for Scott to step down and I'm going to have him in a O to Jonathan Kessler. I'm going to have him use the push here. All right. All right, Mr. Ferris. What I want you to do, I'm going to give you this red push pin. Just kind of, I know you can't see it, but just kind of estimation so the jury can turn just a little bit this way so see. Put that pin about where the fire pit would be, the burn pile. So roughly from this angle, you're kind of right under this tree right here. So you mark the red push pin kind of just from the house, the line that goes out to the woods, and you're estimating that about there is where the burn, the burn pile is? Yes, sir. And Judge, we'll take a picture of that and put it into the record at some point. I left off yesterday talking about the timeline. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, July 3rd, 
and July 4th, and we talked about where you were at on those days. I want to now turn your attention and start talking about Thursday, July 5th of 2018. About what time do you remember getting up that morning? It had to have been somewhere around maybe 8.30 to 9 o'clock. I don't really remember the exact time. What were your plans that day? Uh, my plans were uh, go ahead and take care of animals, and then I was going to go and get my hair cut and they, then meet my buddy uh, Ted at the PGA store. Did y'all, a um, day or so before, or sometime get a, a connection with somebody at the PGA store? Yes, uh, uh, I believe it was the weekend prior uh, to all this that we play golf uh, with some friends at the Manor Golf Club, mm -hmm. and one of the guys we played with, he works for TaylorMade, and he works out of the PGA store down in Roswell, and he was going to go and have me get into a simulator to get, you know, fitted for clubs my size because I'm a tall guy, so I have to have extended clubs. So where were you actually going? What's the, where was the store at you were going to drive to? It's down off of uh, Holcomb Bridge, off of 400 in Roswell. Who's going to go with you? Ted was. And what's Ted's full name? Uh, I'm sorry, I have a hard time actually pronouncing his real name. It's uh, Theodophilus uh, is his real name, but we call him Ted. Okay, what's his last name? Pierce. How long have you known Ted? Going up on close to 10 years. Good friend? Yes. Knowing anyone else in his family? Uh, his entire family, his mother and sister. And how close are you today? Uh, I've actually known his sister, Randy, a lot longer, uh, over 10 years now. And, you know, I met Ted and uh, their mother uh, pretty much at the same time. And, you know, they're Alabama fans, and we always watch football together. And they're like my second family. And did you have their numbers in your phone? Yes, sir. Do you remember what you uh, labeled his mom's number as? I believe it's uh, Mom Pierce. And did they have, were they involved with you with, at the lake and things like that? Yes, sir. Okay. When you got up at some point that morning, uh, did you leave to go to the PJ store? Did you get in your truck and take off down the driveway? Yeah, so after I got done taking care of all the animals and everything was situated for the day, I got in my truck to start heading out. And I happened to notice that my youngest sister, Amanda, her vehicle was over there. So I decided to pull up over there to say hi to her. Yeah. Where was, did you see her or just her vehicle? I didn't see her at first until I pulled up in to the house driveway and I saw her uh, sitting with Melody on the front porch. This is Thrasher 2. When you say front porch, is this what you're talking about? Yes, right there where the uh, front door is. Oh, yeah, I should turn the TV back on. There we go. All right, on Thrasher 2 here, this area where the hand is, where were they sitting? Did you just have chairs or something, or? Are you see the, uh, the window right there? Yes, right there. Right here? Uh, yes, there's a rocking chair right there, and they were both uh, sitting in that area. When you saw them, what did you do? I got out, of the, got out of my truck and walked up to them. When you walked up, did you notice what they were doing? And they, it looked like they were sitting there talking. What were their demeanors like? At first glance, before talking to them, I mean, it seemed normal. Nothing out of the ordinary? No, I did not see anything. Uh, when you walked up, were you, what were you planning on doing? Just saying hi or? Yeah, just say, you know, hi to my sister. Uh, I, I think I haven't seen her since uh, my dad's birthday party. Was she there to pick up Cameron? That I didn't know. I didn't know the, the kids were there. When you walked in, did you start talking to him? Yes, I did. What y'all talking about? Uh, the very first thing I was asked is, have you seen your father? Who asked you that? Uh, I want to say it was Melody. Did you think anything about that at the moment? I mean, I, when she asked me that, I was like, well, no. 
And then she said, well, we can't find him. I go, what do you mean you can't find him? They're like, well, he's not in the house. And I looked and I said, well, his Mercedes is right there in the garage. The RTV is parked right there in the driveway. He's got to be here. Where was the RTV parked? Do you remember? Uh, it was parked, I know it's, there's like a little parking spot right here where the concrete is. Mm -hmm. uh, before you get to the garage? Yes. Uh, so if you're pulling up to the house, it would have just been right there to the right. Just kind of a pull in, is that what it yes. is? His car's at the house, RTV's there. Uh, why'd you think that was odd if all that was there? Well, I mean, if they're saying that he's not in the house, there's only going to be two things he's going to either be on or be in, and that was on the RTV or he's gone in his car. Would, it, would your dad just kind of disappear? Was that something normal would happen? No. Uh, did he take many business trips or anything? Not really. I mean, he, you know, would always let me know if he was going to be, you know, going somewhere with clients or if he was definitely going to be gone like overnight, he would have said something to somebody. When was the last time you had seen your dad? All right, we need to slip on a break. Uh, still direct uh, examination here. The cross hasn't started, obviously. Scott Ferris detailing that day, July 5th. We'll get a break in and head right back into this courtroom. Stay with us. TV Live. I'm Ted Rollins in for Julie Grant on this Friday. We're tracking two cases, both in the state of Georgia. Our top story, the burn pile murder trial of Melody Ferris is underway this morning. The cross-examination of her son, Scott, about to take place. They're still on direct. We'll head back into the courtroom. It could make or break the case in just a minute. Also, later this morning, the man accused of killing nursing student Lakin Riley on the University of Georgia campus will be in court. Jose Ibarra that hearing, 10 o'clock Eastern. More updates on his case as the day progresses here on Court TV. But now let's head back to that courtroom in North Georgia where Scott Ferris is on the stand in the Burn Pile murder trial. Here we go. When was the last time you had seen your dad? At Cherokee Ranch on the third. Once your mom asked that question, did she ask anything else or do anything else? There was a lot of questions. Uh, once from there, uh, we tried to figure out where he could have possibly gone. Did you ask her about the CPAP? Eventually, yes. I did ask. I was like, well, have you checked to see if a CPAP machine is here? What did she say to that? And she said, no, I haven't checked. Did you ask? Um what all people have, where they went to check for them or how long they've been looking for them or anything like that? If I asked them that? Yeah. I really don't remember. Was there any indication about how long, if she asked, have you seen your father, was there any indication that they had been looking for him or how long he'd been missing or anything? Well, to me, it, I mean, it seemed like they were, you know, at some point trying to look for him because they told me, we can't find your father. Was this, what time of day would this have been when you're up there with them, this started? Roughly, you know, I'd probably say around 10 o'clock in the morning. What'd y'all do after that? Was there any more conversation or what happened? Yeah, we sat there and, you know, tried to figure out where he possibly could be. Um, she, I knew, uh, no, one of them asked if I saw them up, if I saw him up at the barn. I was like, no, I was just up there. there I didn't see him. Um, and, you know, I said, the RTV's here. You know he's not going to walk up to the barn. He's going to drive that. I was like, he's got to be here. And, I mean, all that from that day, I mean, that conversation is, I don't remember every single detail of those, you know, what was asked and where, you know, how, do you remember how long y'all stood there and just talked about it before you did anything? No, I didn't keep time of it, but I uh, mean, it seemed like a good five minutes, five to ten minutes, you know, trying to figure out where he could have gone. 
was there any panic or any um, type of high energy or anybody you know, trying to do something really quick or what was the mood of everybody at that time? At that time, there was I didn't notice any kind of anybody panicking. Uh, I started to you know get worried because I was worried that you know I hope something didn't happen to him that where he had like a heart attack or something. Uh, but I do know I was you know after I asked uh, her if the CPAP machine was still here. Um, and she said, I haven't checked. I said, well, let me go down and check. And I went down to the basement and uh, checked to see if the CPAP machine was there and it was still sitting beside his bed. Um, I think also before I went down, we discussed about uh, if he could have gone, you know, shooting uh, with a client, uh, either skeet shooting or bird hunting. Did uh, he do that a lot? He would do that, at, you know, not a lot, but at least, you know, once or twice a year. When it comes to your dad just leaving, going, going somewhere, not really telling anybody, in the last six months, how many times do you think he had done that? Up to the six months before this? Leave and not tell anybody? Right. Well, he always told me, uh, especially uh, if Melody wasn't there, if she's gone up in Tennessee, he would, you know, let me know, hey, I'm going to be coming home late or, you know, I got, you know, this work right. event or something like that. How many times in, in the previous six months up to this day did your dad go somewhere like that? I'm trying to get a feel for how many times he would just go somewhere and not be at the house. I, I really don't remember because he didn't leave. He didn't do stuff like that much. He literally went to work all the time and came home uh, every single day. So uh, it wasn't often that he did that. Would it be less than five? Less than 10, less than 20? Less would than it? five times, if anything. And wh how long would he be gone if he did leave? I know occasionally he went to go, you know, see his mother who was in a uh, assisted living or, you know, nursing home type deal. Um, when he left, would he take an Uber? No, he always drove his own vehicle. So his vehicle would be with him if he left? Yes. Did he exclusively drive that Mercedes and not the Toyota or anything like that? No, the Mercedes was his his vehicle. And when he left, would he take a CPAP machine? If he was going to be gone overnight, yes, he would have taken a CPAP. The one that was beside the bed, that would be missing? Yes, sir. When you're, Did you ask your mom when the last time she had seen your dad when you're sitting there on the porch talking? I believe I did. I mean... Do you remember when she said last time she saw him? I want to say she would have uh, said on the third. On the third. Did you ask her whether or not he had come and got something to eat or she made food for him or anything like that? Uh, like I said, I don't remember every single detail of that, but, you know, that probably would have, I would have asked that question because my dad texts me all the time about getting food. Uh, see whether or not your dad had gone. All right, Scott Ferris on direct. We'll get a break. First, let's check in with Tommy Pope. Uh, observations there. Tommy, one thing I did notice is that he went down to the basement to check to see if the CPAP machine was there. Could he have dropped the bullet? Ah, Ted, you've been watching too much court TV. I think I, I don't believe people drop bullets uh, intentionally. I don't know where that, I, I still can't figure out how you got a loose bullet that's not in something. So I, I think he's, you know, building the basis for what occurred. You know, I think the prosecution wouldn't hurt to remind them the time because he's he's pretty almost too matter of fact. And, and you know, I mean, he's doing a good job. He says he can't remember some things. And again, he's lay in the scene but you know it's also his dad that's ended up in the burn pile so you know you know different people again handle emotion different ways but you know sometimes the one that commits it going back to your uh, theory could the kids have done it you know they seem to be more matter of fact when they're trying to cover up for something they did so uh, I, it's going to be interesting it's going to unfold when we get down to the specifics it was interesting to me 
you know, the fact she lied to law enforcement about her relation, you know, with the boyfriend, that seems simplistic. But, you know, what have you got to lie about if uh, if you didn't have anything to do with it? Oh, I think this family lied about a lot of things. And their public persona was so different than what was going on behind the ranch doors. Let's get a break. Uh, we'll get you back into the courtroom right after this. For more of the direct of Scott Ferris, Cross is still to come. Stay with us. We want to understand the mindset behind your actions in this case. Tell me, why are you here? She needed payback. Payback with her life? Really funny, really. I'm laughing. Did you see me? I left. I don't want any of this. Are you not prepared today to take responsibility for any of your crimes? <laughs> Interview with a Killer, a Court TV original series, premieres October 20th, only on Court TV. Um. Quick programming note before we head back into the courtroom in Georgia. The director of the new Netflix documentary, The Menendez Brothers, will be joining Vinny Politan tonight uh, on Vinny Politan Investigates. He spoke to the brothers from jail. First time uh, they spoke about the case, obviously, in nearly 30 years. Don't want to miss it. Uh, interview tonight, 9 o'clock Eastern, only here on Court TV. Now let's head back to Georgia, where Scott Ferris is on the stand. It's still direct. Cross is coming. Let's watch. Let's see whether or not your dad had gone one of the previous nights to go get something to eat from somewhere or anything like that. I don't remember anything of that. At some point, your dad's wallet appeared. Is that right? Yes. And that, to you, was that odd? So I know prior to that, you know, my dad would never leave the house, you know, without his wallet. Um, so I believe, I think I asked, you know, at some point, it's like, well, have you seen his wallet? Because uh, it's, it's like a process of elimination. You know, I think the first thing anybody would ask is, well, is the wallet still here? And then uh, she said, no, we, you know, I haven't seen it. Um, there was only one place my dad ever would have left his wallet. Where's that? And that would have been on the dresser uh, in the master bedroom. Um, cause he still used the master bedroom. He slept downstairs, but you know, he showered and changed and everything upstairs in the master bathroom. Did the defendant ever have his wallet on this day? So I do know, I remember her asking if she's seen his wallet. She said no and all. And then, you know, I started asking about like the CPAP machine and, and then I said, I'll go check, you know, see if that's down there. I'll see if the shotgun, you know, the shotgun he would have used to go bird hunting or skeet shooting is, you know, down there. Cause it was both in the same room. Um, and just, uh, I mean, I found it odd that she didn't ask, you know, she didn't go check to see if the CPAP machine was there. Do you remember whether or not she said she, she, do you remember whether or not she brought the wallet or had the wallet at all? So I remember after going down and checking on that, I came back up and she had his wallet in his hand. And I said, where'd you find that? And she said, it was in the, his console of his Mercedes. And that really struck me odd because my dad never left his wallet in the Mercedes. Why is that? Because he just always had it in his pocket. He never, you know, he, it was a habit of him. He never left it. Uh, I have a habit of leaving mine, but he never did. Your dad's wallet is one what we're talking about. His wallet. Yes, sir. That's it. So it would be either on him or where again? It would have been on the dresser uh, in the bedroom. Uh, right next to the door that leads into the master bathroom. Would he, was it common for your dad to let your mom have the wallet? I mean, he would never hand it to her, but he didn't, you know, lock it up and secure it. Talking about the two cell phones of, of your mom, did you tell law enforcement about the two cell phones? Yes. Did your mom ever mention anything to you about the cell phone? Was Sherry's cell phone? I do not ever remember that, no. Tell the jury, all right, you're on the front porch. This is going on. Do you ever get kind of perturbed or, 
upset with your mom or, or ask her why she hasn't done certain things? Do y'all start talking about, you know, what have you done or why have you done these, th these things? I mean, I probably would have, you know, said when I asked about the CPAP machine, I go, why wouldn't you go check that? I mean, that's, that's a big thing. If he, if he was going to be gone overnight, he's going to be taking that. Where all did you go look again? Where did you start looking? Where did you uh, go from there? Let's start in the house. Where all in the house did you go? I believe I went into first the, the master bedroom to check to see if his wallet was there. And then I think I left from there and went down to the basement and checked for his CPAP machine and see if the shotgun was sitting in the closet. Did you see any signs of him or anything in the no, house? No, sir. Did anybody start helping you look for your father? Once, I know Chris arrived at some point. Uh, I don't really remember when he did, but uh, after going down into the basement and checking that stuff, I came back up and said, yeah, everything's still down there. Uh, I said, like, I'll go over here. I'll go back up to the barn and check around there. So I started searching the property because, like you said, we're, at this point, I was worried that, you know, he would have gone out and, you know, had a heart attack or something or fell down, something like that, medical-wise. Do you know where your mom and Amanda, your sister, you know what they were doing while, while you were looking for your dad? I just know they were together the, pretty much the whole entire time. Did anybody get on the RTV and start running around looking for him? I know I jumped on it to ride back up to the barn to check, see if he might have been up around there. Uh, and, you know, once I checked up around the house and all, uh, I noticed the tractor was parked uh, not where we would have parked it for, you know, overnight. Um, and I actually went down and checked around there because I saw the tractor sitting there and it was right at the manure pile. And so I checked around the manure pile to make sure he wasn't laying, laying down around that. You see on your screen there, Stuart 12, this is a photograph that's already been admitted. Is this where you found the tractor? Yes, sir, it was. Now, the manure pile, are you talking about this pile right in front of it? Yes, sir. Uh, was there anything, why was, was that odd that the tractor was parked there? Yeah, because it never would have been really left there. The only time we would have brought it down there is to to turn over the, the manure pile because it was, you know, compost. Not, you mean turn it, turn it over, not just push the, the pile, but actually turn it over? You mean we'll go scoop it, you know, like, you know, kind of toss on a salad. Uh, but not leave, you wouldn't leave the tractor right there? Would your dad leave the tractor right there? No. Uh, Does the tractor be parked where I'm pointing up here? Yes, uh, right behind that uh, blue wheelbarrow. After you saw the tractor and you were down the bar, where did you go? So I've continued to, you know, search around there. I uh, didn't see him there or inside the barn. So I hopped back on the RTV. The state believes that Melody used that tractor to get her husband's body onto the burn pile. We'll get a break in here and head right back into the courtroom, picking it up right where we left off. Stay with us. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Ted Rollins filling in for Julie Grant on this Friday as we round out another week at Court TV. Happening now, the Burn Pile murder trial underway in Georgia. The defendant and victim's son, Scott Ferris, is on the stand. The defendant, of course, Melody Ferris, is accused of killing his dad, Gary, and putting his body in a fire pit on the family's property. Let's head back into the courtroom. We're still on direct examination. Around to the house uh, and once again I still don't remember if Chris was there or not um, and I really don't remember where Amanda and Melody were standing at at that moment but I just started searching and you know around the other shed where the chicken coop was looked in the shed make sure he wasn't in there um, I was just you know starting my process of checking the property how much of the property do you think everyone covered looking for your dad? Man, I believe every, you know, square foot of the property was 
uh, covered. Did you check uh, the front property too, the fields and pastures and things like that, or where all did you go? I mean, yeah, I'll look, man, it's all wide open, so there's no grass. I always had the grass cut uh, at that time, so it wasn't tall. So if he was laying in the pasture, I would have been able to see him. When your dad was making the burn pile or stacking it or working on it, where would the RTV usually be if he was out there doing something like that? Within, you know, five to 10 feet of that burn pile. And where would your dad normally park the RTV in relation to his, uh, where he would stay in the basement? So if he went to his office, it would have been, you know, kind of parked right up there next to the house or he'd just hop off and only take a few steps to get get into his office. Do you remember your mom saying anything about whether or not she moved the RTV? No, I, re I don't really remember. Uh, Did you find anything odd about the RTV and, or anything like that? Or? No, not, a, uh, uh, not with the RTV. I mean... Like I said, I saw it parked in the driveway when I got there, and that was, you know, one indication. I was like, well, he's got to be here. Talking about your tractor, is it, uh, is it difficult to drive that? Absolutely not. Uh, how do you make the tractor go forward, and how do you make it go backwards? So that tractor right there, one of the reasons why my dad wanted to purchase that is because it was so easy to drive. Uh, you didn't have to shift gears or anything like that. So the the pedal on it um it's like a c so you would hit on the top part of it and it will go forward and you hit on the bottom part of it and it will go in reverse Uh, this is Shaw 259. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Tell the jury how it worked. You, if you put your foot on that pedal there on the right, there, top, kind of middle of the photograph, how would that work? So the, you know, the, you can see the bigger, you know, foot pedal right there. This? Yes. That's where you would push and the, and the tractor will go forward. And if you want to go backwards? You hit on that uh, section. You don't like to change gears or anything like that or have two transmissions or anything? No. Uh, did you know if your mom could drive the tractor? Oh, yeah, she definitely knew how to use it. She was using it uh, just a couple days prior to the third. In relation to the burn pile where you've marked, uh, did you ever go up that area and look at the trail camera or anything like that? Yeah, so actually it was Melody who asked me when we were, you know, uh, I don't remember exactly when, but I, it, it was still on. We were either back on the front porch, but she asked me, she, she asked if I still had that trail camera down there. I was like, oh yeah, let me, you know, I'll go check it. So I, uh, I don't remember if I hopped on the RTV or I walked down there, but uh, I went down there and checked the trail camera and saw no indication of my dad being on it. What'd you do with the trail camera while you were there? Uh, I checked whatever pictures were on it. I know there look, might have been a couple of animals. Uh, I want to say I saw a picture of uh, Amanda and Melody walking. Uh, but it was mainly animals, but I saw no indication of my dad walking by or anybody who uh, didn't, you know, was in my family. Did you see anything suspicious on it? No. Did you delete the things off the camera? I did because it's just, you know, natural habit. Um, this, like, like I said, this is prior to us discovering my dad's remains. So every single time I ever went to go check my trail camera, you know, I always delete, just kind of free up the, the SD card because I use it for deer hunting. And, you know, if I have a doe walking by, I'm not going to, you know, want to save it. I want to save, you know, whatever bucks. And the camera, again, was pointing down into the woods away from the burn pile? Yes, it was pointing towards my neighbor's property. How long, I'll ask you about 
finding your father's remains. How long do you think you were looking before you uh, went to the burn pile? Uh, Did y'all walk by before? Did you get close to it before? Well, I had to go buy it to go down there and check the trail camera. I didn't even think to look at the, you know, the fire. Uh, Didn't even cross my mind. Um, And I know I came back up and let them know there was nothing on it. And then I said, well, I'm going to go and, you know, check on the the other side of the pond, you know, walk across the dam uh, and go check down over there on that side of the property. Uh, Because it was rare if he did it, but he did it every once in a while. He would go on that section of the property because it was a little tight to drive the RTV down there. This is Shaw two here and this is the burn pile we're talking about yes at some point ultimately you did find the remains of your father is that right yes um how i found it like i said i was going to check the other side of the the pond on you know across the dam um And I started walking that way, and I believe I got either halfway across the dam or got to the other side, and then Melody called me. And she called me and asked, have you thrown a dead goat on the burn pile? I'm like, no, we haven't had anything to die, and also I wouldn't throw it on the burn pile. And she said, well, come up here and look at this. So I was like, okay. Well, I turned around and started walking, and I see Amanda walking she was almost kind of like right in front of my dad's office uh coming from the you know the burn pile area walking back up towards the driveway uh she was walking there and melody was standing in, over near the burn pile uh, and i walk up and look and i can already start seeing bones and then i look down and it appeared to me that it was the inside of a skull. The backside was gone. And it, you can see like the little blood vessels, uh, I think it was, but it, it didn't look like a rock or something. So I grabbed a very, very small corner of it and I lifted it up just enough to where I saw teeth and an eye socket and I immediately put it right back. And, you know, I was crouched down and she was standing right there next to me and i raise up i put my hand on you know across her chest and push her back and go these are human remains i am calling 911 right now nobody's allowed down here and at that same time that's when i noticed chris was there and he was coming around the back side of the house with the girls on the rtv and i walked right up to him and i said get those girls out of here right now. I'm calling 911. And I pretty much, he, my brother would argue, or, you know, with me on anything like that. And I believe just the look on my face and everything, he didn't second question me. He's like, okay. And he turned, turned around and pulled off with the girls and I called 911. When you call 911, do you even remember what you said to them? I believe that, you know, they called uh, and they asked, you know, did the normal r- routine uh, and I said, hey, I was like, uh, it was along the lines of, you know, we've been searching for my dad and after searching, you know, we came across some remains in a burn pile and I said I was deployed to Iraq I've seen bodies burned up and it's like this definitely looks like a burned up body Uh, we need we need somebody out here now were you thinking it was your dad pretty much by that point yeah because there was nobody else who it could have been and my dad was missing I mean, my dad didn't 
have any enemies. There was nobody who, you know, we never really had strangers walking across our property. Now, never once had I ever catch anybody on our property. Uh, so it was, within an instant, I knew that this was 99% sure this was my dad. After you called 911, what'd you do? <clears throat> I remember I got off the phone with them and I walked up to the driveway. I don't remember if I went on the back side of the house or the, the pond side of the house, but I came back up to the driveway and Amanda was standing there in the driveway. And I walked up to her and said, Amanda, this is not good. She's like, what are you talking about? I go. There's human remains in that burn pot. I've called 911, the police are on their way. But I was like, Amanda, this is not good. And she just kept saying, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And that's all I remember telling her that. Um, and then I was, I don't remember who I let know, but I said, I'm gonna go meet, you know, who's ever coming up at the driveway. Um, at the road so they know where to exactly come to. And I started to walk up towards the road. What was Amanda like at this time? At that time, when, like, once I told her about finding the remains, that's when she, you know, was somebody who act like, you know, they just found out something bad happened, especially to a loved one. It was kind of like she was shaking and, you know, like, like I said, she's like, what do you mean? What do you mean? And like almost in tears. What was your mom doing? As in what? How was she acting? What was she doing? What'd you Never saw any kind of motion out of her. Uh, did you see she didn't she get did? angry with anybody, and she showed no... I didn't notice any of her freaking out or anything like that. Uh, the only time that I saw her actually try to kind of show some emotion is after the, the deputy and the paramedic came back up from the burn pile to say, yes, those are human remains. And then... Just the way that she started acting, it, it, I've seen my mother cry, I mean, hundreds of times throughout my life and all, and it, it appeared to me to be fake. Like, this wasn't her emotion. I, her reaction to finding out her, you know, mom had a heart attack and her dad dying and, you know, anything bad happened like that. It was a complete different reaction to what she reacted to when the paramedic and deputy said, yes, those were human remains. Up until that point, has she cried or anything? No. Did she come up to you and ask you a lot of questions or anything? When? Before, after finding the, the remains and before law enforcement got there, was she asking you questions or saying anything to anybody? I really don't remember, because after, you know, I talked to Amanda, uh, because I was heading in that direction. Uh, I knew I was going to meet them at the end of the driveway up at the road. And that's where I saw Amanda and I let Amanda know. After I let Amanda know, I continued walking down the driveway to go meet who, uh, either the police or paramedics that were coming. Um, so I walked up to the end of the road. And from there, no, I don't remember her ever ask, you know, talking to me during that time. At some point, did your feelings change or suspicion arise about something, something's afoot here? I knew something was, I felt something was very off. There was red flags prior to finding my dad. Uh, her having his wallet, uh, I remember at one point uh, she said that she had the credit card 
that the one my dad gave me and said never, you know, hold on to this like your life depended on it. Because uh, there was a lot of times my dad said, don't ever give her the credit card. And she had it. And I, I remember asking her, I go, how do you have this? She goes, well, your father gave it to me. And I knew that was a straight up lie. I mean, y'all have seen it in the text messages that he, you know, said for me to hold on to that credit card. Um, Did you start talking about a gun? So. A pistol. So prior to all this happening, I want to say it was in June. Uh, I don't remember if it was like the first week of June or the second week of June. Um, we had an AT&T guy come out and do some work with the satellites and all. There was an issue or something. Uh, and Melody was gone. She was in Tennessee. Uh, and my dad had to go to work. He sent me a text one morning and said, hey, the, you know, the guys are coming today. I want you to come over here and uh, I'll show you what's going on. So when, when they got there, the, uh, we were working down in the basement. Uh, the TV uh, that's in front of the leather chair and all, uh, because right next to it is a closet that actually had the main satellite box. And a lot of those components in there was the, uh, the home theater components. But the main box for the satellite was in that closet. But he said he needed the remote to the TV uh, in, the, in the basement room right there in front of the bar area. Uh, so I started searching the drawers because we only use the satellite uh, remote to turn on and off the TV but he needed the actual TV remote. So I started searching the drawers and the furniture around in that room, first checked under the TV, um, didn't see it in there, and then I went to, there was a piece of furniture behind the couch, and I opened it and I saw a revolver and a leather holster, and I, you know, I looked at it and I could tell it was, you know, a 38 Special uh, snub nose. Um, I was like, huh, I've never seen that one before. And didn't really think anything of it because, I mean, my whole life we've always had guns. So. Uh, this was in June of 2018. Yes, this is like either the middle of June or the beginning of June, somewhere in there. So it was just, a, you know, a few weeks prior to my dad's death. How much of the gun did you see? I mean, I looked at it enough to, you know, that I knew roughly what you know what type of gun it was do you know guns i'm fairly knowledgeable i mean i don't can't name every single gun that's ever been made but i know you know the difference between you know a rifle a shotgun and you know a semi-automatic handgun and a revolver and um describe this gun that you saw so i definitely remember it being in like a old leather holster um I can't really remember the type of handle, but it wasn't uh, what you call a blue finish, which is that dark black color. Uh, it was more of like, you know, nickel, chrome type look. Uh, Do you remember the handle or anything about it? No, I don't remember the, the handle. Like I said, I don't remember the color of the handle. For the jury, if you were to, if you were standing outside, you're those, what I call, again, the American doors, if you're outside and looking into where the couch is and the ottoman and everything is, where you're dead, where you would hang out and eat dinner. Okay. If you walk into the doors, tell the jury where this uh, drawer or this dress or whatever it is where you found this. So if I would have had my back to the door, the couch would have been right in front of me, and that piece of furniture would have been right here to my right. When you found the gun, what did you do with it? I didn't do anything with it. Did you touch it, pick it up, move it, or just look at it? 
I kind of maybe grabbed enough to kind of like look at it, uh, but I did not pull it out, out of the drawer uh, because I had the AT&T guy in the basement with me. I didn't want to freak him out. But no, I never really fully picked it up and, you know, looked at it. So yeah, that would have been the piece of furniture, the lamp there. You're talking about right here, this is Thrasher 226? Yes, that was the piece of furniture that I saw it in on the top drawer. Uh, so this is the sliding doors coming in being on the right? Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> when did you start, why did you start thinking about this gun? What made you think about gun and who did you start telling about this gun? When? On the 5th. On the 5th? So... After, you know, talking with her and, you know, the comments that she's made previously, everything was just, I was getting red flags and all. And when I went down to check on the CPAP machine and the shotgun, after I checked the shotgun, I remember it's like, I remember seeing that revolver. So I just wanted to go over and look to see if it was still in that drawer. So and on the 5th, did you go to see if that gun was there? Yes. And what happened? So I went and opened that drawer and that gun was not there and closed the drawer back, didn't look anywhere else, and I went back upstairs. Uh, and then on my way back upstairs, I noticed a drop of blood on the floor. Um, it was smaller than a dime, uh, and it was, you know, kind of almost right there before you get to the stairway. Right by the stairs, the, the yes. corner there? So I didn't want to bring anything up at that time because this like i said this is prior to finding my dad and you know i didn't want to be like hey there is a you know i want to go see if there was a gun down there and it's not there anymore uh, but you know back when i found it you know melody was gone my dad was at work and I just forgot all about it. But our, you know, for some reason that day when I went to go check to see if the shotgun was there, it reminded, it reminded me that that gun was in that drawer. And just something told me to go just check to see if it was still there. Did you, afterwards on the 5th, when law enforcement came, did you talk to them? Yes. Did you tell them about this gun? Yes. Did you tell them about the blood? Yes. Did you tell them about other things you found unusual? Yes, or her uh, behavior and stuff like that, yes. And then on, I think you, so you talked to law enforcement on July 5th, I believe, at the scene. Is that with yes. the detective cocking doll in the vehicle? Yes, I, I mean, there was, so I was sat in the passenger seat, and I, I honestly don't remember who all was in the vehicle, but there was somebody in the driver's seat, and then I remember there was either one or two people in the back seat. And then Detective Hayes is behind me here. At some point the next day, I think you went and talked to him again? I want to say it was him that night, because... Uh, yeah, that night into the next day, yeah, down at I, the Freeman Precinct. Yes, I don't really remember talking to Detective Hayes there, right there on the property. Uh, my, you know, my memory that I think the first time I remember talking to him was at the uh, free home fire and police precinct. Like one time on the scene and then talking to the detective at the precinct. Yes. There was a lot of police officers and detectives and everybody out there, so I can't say exactly who I talked to at all from my knowledge, but uh, I talked to a lot of different police officers. Just this time on Tim Davis State's Exhibit uh This is the direct duties. Oh, yeah. No, no objection. So seven. Now, state seven. So it's S fares seven, S fares eight, and S fares nine. All right, everybody. Hey, Let's start with nine. That's fair as nine. Not seven or eight. Let's, let's go to nine. Well, 
on this one here, you see there's some text message between you and your dad on the cell phones. It's yes, about, I do. Let's see, looks like on June 6, 2018, at the first one, 109, 12.07 p.m. Yes. This is from you to your dad. Can you read what that says? Uh, okay, so he called some mix up. He will be there around two. And then, okay. Let's start, let's see. Let me see the times. Let's start at 112. So 6 6 2018. 9 18 36. You see that? Yes, sir. All right, it's from you to your dad, and then we're going to go upwards. Oh, that's. All right, so it, let's start. It with looks the, like it's from my dad to me. Yeah, to you, from your dad, and what is that message? Uh, Direct TV guys coming. Come here and let me show you the ISSR. All right, then so, yeah. from you to your dad, the next one up. What's that say? Starting with, did they? Uh, did they give you a time frame on when they will be here? All right, then. Going up to the next one, okay. looks like to you from your dad. Yes, he responded uh, before 12. And then the last one there. He called and some mix up, he'll be there, be there around two. And you thought it was AT&T, could it be in DirecTV? I believe AT&T and DirecTV are the But this is what you're company. talking about. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. It was to do with the satellite, so DirecTV is satellite. This is S. Ferris Seven. This is something we we pulled in the case. Can you see the date time here at the top? Can you just tell us what that is? 2018, uh, June 5th. Uh, time is 1248. And then the message contents. Just read that for us, if you would. Uh, you would reply yes. Reply yes uh, to confirm your direct TV, direct TV appointment at 6 6 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Reply no to reschedule. Uh, to stop receiving this message, reply stop. And then S. Ferris 8, uh, this is a June 6, 2018 text from them. And the message contents, what does that say? You can just. Hello, we recently completed the direct TV visit. If you're experiencing service issues, please reply or call 678 971 2219. Uh, to guarantee tech within 24 hours. Were you running around repeatedly saying there's lots of blood down there, there's lots of blood down there, or anything like that? I never once said that. Mm, okay, critical, because uh, if he did say it, it wasn't true. There wasn't a lot of blood down there. Let's get a break, get you back into the courtroom for more of the direct examination of the son, who the defense says killed dad. An A-list actor charged in a fatal shooting on a film set. There is no way for the court to right this wrong. Victim to Verdict with Ted Rollins. Season finale, Sunday night, 8, 7 central. Only on Court TV. Sarah Boone is charged with second-degree murder after her boyfriend suffocated inside of a suitcase. Sarah, I can't breathe. I thought he was okay. The Suitcase Murder Trial. Live coverage starting Monday morning, 8, 7 central on Court TV. I'm Matt Johnson in North Georgia covering the Burn Pile Murder Trial. This is Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Welcome back. Let's head back into the courtroom. Melody Ferris is accused of killing her husband. Her son, Scott Ferris, is on the witness stand, and the defense is accusing him of murder. Let's watch. I want to juxtapose two, two, two points on June 5th and June 6th. So one is when you're at the scene and you're talking to law enforcement, and then June 5th going into June 6th at the Free Home Precinct when you talk to law enforcement. You mean July? Yes, excuse me, I'm sorry. July, 6th, July 5th and July 6th. The two positions I want to talk about is when you're at the scene and then you're down at the precinct, 
At what point did you learn that there was actually a, a bullet was found in your father's rib? So we were there very, very late at night. I know it was probably close to 11, midnight or so. Uh, and they kept us in a kind of a conference room. Uh, and they brought us one by one back into another room individually. Uh, I don't remember who they brought back first and all, but by the time they brought me back, uh, I believe it was Detective Hayes that was there with me. Uh, I don't really remember the details of what all was discussed at first, and then I was informed that they discovered a, a bullet lodged in the rib bone. Do you remember Detective Hayes saying, I've got something i got to tell you? Do you remember how he broached that or, or told you about it? I don't remember his exact words on how he did that because, you know, once I was told that that was happening, it, that happened, uh, my mind just went into kind of shock, I'll say. At that point, did you suspect your mom? Definitely. Was she there with you at the precinct? She was there in the, the, the room that we were all kept in at. Who else was there? Amanda was there. Um, possibly Chad, Bruce. Um, I don't remember if Chris and Emily were there. Um, After you were told that, did you go out and talk to others about what you were told? That night? It did, did the other family members, were they told about the bullet? I didn't discuss, I don't remember discussing that with them, you know, after I came back out of the room. What, did you ask your mom anything when you left? I really don't remember if I did or not. Afterwards, at, after July 6th, you couldn't go back to the property? No, so, you know, they informed us for us to go up to that precinct and we were all, you know, able to drive up there uh, we didn't have to ride in any squad cars or anything like that, but they did inform us that we were not allowed to be go back to the property. <clears throat> so, uh, from what I remember, M Melody went and stayed with Amanda, and you know, once we were fully released for the night, I left and went back up to the lake house because uh, Ted was there and some other friends. So I knew I had somewhere to go to sleep that night. Afterwards, did the I guess was there a, a splitting of the family afterwards? My son went one way, and the others went the other way. Oh yeah, I mean, it, once we found out that you know there was a bullet found in the rib bone, that you know, obviously he's been shot and then burned, and we all, you know, we all put the pieces together because my dad had no enemies. Uh, I never once met anybody in my entire life that hated my dad. Uh, so we knew somebody, you know, wouldn't have come there. The house wasn't wrecked. I mean, there was nothing. Everything was adding up to us that it wasn't a robbery and it wasn't anything like that. And, you know, her history of, you know, having affairs and doing all this shady stuff that she's done and especially her making the comment, I can't wait for the day he's dead and I don't have to live with him anymore. Um, Did Amanda support your mom or support y'all? So I remember for several weeks, it seemed like, Amanda kept saying, well, he just had a heart attack and fell in the fire. And I was like, Amanda, how could he have had a heart attack and fell in the fire when A, they found a bullet lodged in his rib bone, 
And she was like, well, they could be lying to us. I was like, okay, well, if he had a heart attack and fell in the fire, why was everything gone from the fire pit? It was like the RTV would have been there or the tractor would have been there. There would have been something. There was no indication to, uh, to especially to me, that he would just would have had a heart attack and fell into the fire. So Amanda was, she was not convinced? She, no, she was not convinced on was she, him being shot. Was she supportive of your mother? She, uh, oh yes, I mean, like I said, she was always glued to her side from the time I showed up over to the house and, and even after, and she was always with her. Now afterwards, The property, the house, and and the contents of the house and things like that. Fair to say that your mother and you and things were having some problems, or some arguments over the disagreements, if you would, over the property and the house and uh, trying to sell it and whatnot. Afterwards, yeah. yes, I mean, it was, she immediately after this was all about trying to get as much money as possible. Was Amanda being a go-between between you and the defendant at times? If I remember right, yeah, she was very much involved and, you know, all of us, I remember all of us getting, you know, hit up about getting, you know, having money handed over to her or something along those lines. When you and your mom afterwards were trying to figure out what to do with the house, because I guess it, it went into the, the probate part, uh, all the property basically was frozen, is that right? Yes, everything from, it seemed like the day of the 5th, they froze everything. So the accounts and things like that? Yes. But on the 5th, was your mom going around asking who was on the bank accounts and stuff like that? No, she was actually asking those questions before finding my dad. That was another, that was another, like I said, her behavior. Uh, she kept asking all of us, are you on, do you have access to the bank account? Uh, at the scene while you're trying to find your dad? Yes, I mean, this is like us trying to figure out where he could be. Now, was it odd at times that you, your mom and you would have to talk and communicate after your father's remains were found? Was Y'all still had to deal with the house and try to uh, deal with that aspect. Did y'all communicate somewhat on that? Yeah, I mean, we were, you know, I guess you said we would, went into kind of a survival mode, you know, trying to figure out how to take care of everything and because, you know, we had you know, a lot of animals we still had to feed and, and, you know, keep lights on and stuff like that. Time I tend to have been as far as five. No objection. Right, this again is the cell right. What I want to look at is if you can turn to page two, number three. So you see how at the top, when you go this from and to, so the first category here with the number is from your mother to you. And does that say, uh, how early can you be home to help me get barn cleaned up? People are coming at 6.30, did you see that? Yes. And what is the date of that one? The time stamp there? Uh, 4 8 2019. So y'all were still communicating after the fact of, of what to do with the house, is that right? Yes. And page four, let's go to number nine. From your mom to you. And there's a text message about uh, go just having a baby. Do you see that? Yes. And that was in April of 2019? Yes. Did you still have to take care of the animals and things like that? Oh, yes. Was anybody else there helping you take care of the animals? No. 
Were you still staying in the barn at that time? Yes, I was. I'm going to go to page nine. On 28 there, do you see it's a message from your mom to you? And that's April 19, 2019. And it says, people come to look at house. It said barn apartment was filthy. Pooping floor smells so bad. Other realtor took pictures. This is beyond, I think she was trying to say unacceptable. You see that? Yes. And then the 29th message we have here on April 19, 2019 at 147, you replied to it. And what did you say? Uh, on the 29th. See right here. What's unacceptable is our father being murdered. Did you find that your mom was saying things to you that you believe were not true or saying to other people things that were not true? Oh, absolutely. About how you were handling the house? Yes. What you were doing? Yes. How bad did it get? Uh, uh, did law enforcement get called on you? Uh, there was a lot of times that I was never told, but animal control kept being called. Uh, and what I picked off, picked up off from the, you know, the deputy who came out from animal, animal control, he kind of acted like it was possibly a neighbor trying to get the animals. Um, so that was the most occurrence of, you know, somebody from the Cherokee County coming out. Did animal control come, ever come and take the animals away from you or write you off or lock you up or anything like that? No, sir. Every time they came out, they said, I showed them, you know, their feed and, you know, their hay. I showed, I walked them around. They looked at all the animals and they're like, yeah, there is nothing wrong. All your animals look healthy. And I mean, do you know whether or not it was your mother behind that? You know? No, I do not know if it was her. Was it during this time that we see here there was disputes going on? Yes. Now, this is page 12. It's number 40 on this extraction. It's from you. Now, You've got mother too. I guess she had different numbers. Is that what you put it in? Yeah, by that time, uh, she had to get a new cell phone because Cherokee County had her uh, other cell phone still. Did your mother, the defendants, start asking you about money and paying things and stuff on the cars and whatnot? If you would, read this message for us that on April the 3rd, 2019, from you to your mother, what does it say? I have been given Amanda $200 every month for insurance. I have it documented. She sent me a text last week saying she canceled the insurance on the Toyota. The lies need to stop because we are not falling for them. Just how we know you're now going around Tennessee telling everyone that Chris and I will get into fights with daddy. You won't talk to about, you won't talk about a disappointment how about you filing a false police report against me? We are not stupid and we are not falling for your laws. Got pretty bad between y'all? Yeah, so the whole police report thing, I believe it was after I came back from my grandmother's funeral, um, I was contacted about meeting with a detective in Woodstock uh, Police Department. Um, later to come out, the reason why I had to go to Woodstock is because since Cherokee County was handling the the, uh, the investigation with my dad, they could not get involved with this one. Um, well, I found out the the police officer I talked to, he said that Melody filed a report that I threatened to kill her, just like how I did my daddy, and and this is all after the fact, right? Yes. So is it fair to describe that as soon as you were after finding your father, the family was together for a little bit, and we've heard about the attorney, I'm not going to go into too much of that, but y'all then went and things separated. You, Chris, and Emily went this way, and Amanda went with your mom, Amanda and Chad Bruce went, your mom went that way. Yes, that's correct. Fair to say that y'all were close together, not pointing fingers or anything like that, but then the time went on and it just branched out. Yes. 
farther and farther the gap got wider and wider. Yes. But there were still, like on page 18 of support number 64 and 65, kind of an odd setting because you still had the house and there's a message from you um, to her, 507 on May 21st, 2019. Did you leave the door unlocked? Do you see that message? Number 64 there. Yes, do you leave, did you leave the door unlocked? She responds and, re replies and responds by saying the key is under front row. You see that? Yes. So at times it could be, I guess, amicable, but would you describe it as just odd and weird afterwards? Just how y'all had to interact at times? Yeah, I had to be very careful because um, I knew with her her aggression towards us, because there were several times that, you know, if something happened that she didn't like, she would come up and start yelling at me and and uh, threatening me and stuff like that. Um, I believe I talked to Detective Hayes, and he was the one to that informed me that you know the record the memo recording on my phone. I'm able to do recording, so. Uh, if I had, you know, any kind of actions, interactions with her, I could record it, and at least there would be some kind of audio uh, documentation of it. Now, tell the jury again, who was Chad Bruce? Chad Bruce, uh, prior, prior to this, was dating my sister Amanda. Are they now married? Yes, they're now mar married. Is he close to your mom? Oh, yes. Very much so. Did y'all have a time after this that y'all had an incident in the, in the roadway outside the property? Yes. Um, so, you know, after all this happened, I knew I had to go find some work. Uh, I did mainly kind of like under the table type work. I didn't go get a full blown job. I was trying to bring in as much cash as possible. You working in a nursery or something? Well, that was, you know, I didn't immediately start going. Okay, we're going to squeeze in a quick break, but before we do, we do have a quick programming note. The director of the new Netflix documentary, The Menendez Brothers, will join Vinnie Politan tonight on Vinnie Politan Investigates. Alejandro Hartman speaks to the brothers from jail. This is the first time they've spoken about the case in nearly 30 years. See never before seen images of the brothers as Lyle and Eric Menendez talk about the murders of their parents in one of the most infamous cases ever seen on Court TV. You don't want to miss this interview tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern on Vinnie Politan Investigates. We'll be right back. Sarah Boone is charged with second degree murder after her boyfriend suffocated inside of a suitcase. There are multiple domestic violence incidents. You two hitting each other. Sarah. This is my name. The word up. He told you, Sarah, I can't breathe. George Torres locked inside of a suitcase begging for help. I thought he was okay. The Suitcase Murder Trial. Live coverage starting Monday morning, 8, 7 central on Court TV. go back to Georgia now for the burn pile murder trial. Defendant Melody Ferris is accused of fatally shooting her husband, prominent attorney Gary Ferris, over the July 4th weekend in 2018. But the defense says there are holes in the investigation and question how Melody would have been able to transport her husband's body to the burn pile where his remains were found. Let's get you back into the courtroom now where Melody and Gary Ferris' son, Scott Ferris, is on direct examination by the state. I didn't immediately start go working at uh, my friend's nursery. Uh, I actually went and worked for somebody who I knew who had a landscaping, uh, cutting, you know, lawns and stuff like that. Well, at I some would, point, you and Chad had an incident in, in the Yeah, so I came, you know, came home from working all day, and I pull up, and I see Amanda and Chad uh, at the driveway. Uh, by this time, we were locking the gate. Uh, and they were standing there, and when I pulled up, Chad started threatening me and cussing at me. So was Amanda. Uh, I don't remember exactly what it was about, but I was being 
uh, yelled at and cussed at. Miss Chad, what, was he aggressive with you? He was, he was definitely yelling and all. Uh, I stayed in my vehicle, but he never came like charging at sure, me. Sure, no fisticuffs or anything. Yeah, though. nothing like that. But he was very, he was yelling and cussing and calling me a piece of shit and all of this stuff. And I was trying, during this, when this was happening, I was trying to hit the record button on my phone. And I somehow, you know, I'm look, keeping my eye on him and trying to hit the record button on my phone in my lap. And I somehow wound up calling my buddy Justin. And all I hear is, hang up, call 911, hang up, call 911. And I was like, okay, so I did that. And I called 911. And by the time 911 got on the phone with me, Amanda and Chad were in their vehicle. And he pulled right up next to me and he was cussing and yelling at me. So uh, you could definitely, if, if you have the 911 recording, you'll be able to hear him. So the tension was spreading to other people too? Yes, I mean, him, uh, Chad and Amanda, pretty much within a month of after uh, of this happening with my dad, they, have, they became fully against us and accusing us of stuff. <clears throat> Scott, I don't really have much more. I have a couple more topics, and then I'm, I'm going to sit down and let the defense ask you some questions. I want to ask you about Rusty. Okay. At what point did you learn about Rusty? It was sometime around Amanda, or not Amanda, but Emily's wedding. Um, I know it was brought up that it was odd that Melody wanted to have him there at the wedding. Uh, we never, I don't ever really remember meeting him as a child. I remember meeting his dad and I also, you know, Martha Jane. Uh, I mean, less than a handful of times we went and saw them through our childhood, so I don't remember Rusty. Yeah, so Scott, what I want to know is on July 5th of 2018, was Rusty Barton even in your mind when this was going on? No, not at the moment, no. Did you learn more stuff after the fact? Oh, yeah, man, you know, but more came out. But your dad didn't know about Rusty Barton? Yes. How do you know he knew about it? I knew at one point uh, my father sent me a text message saying along the lines of the the girlfriend of Rusty Barton that uh, your mother's having an affair with contacted me. I don't remember, you know, what the rest was said in that text message, but uh, I knew by that point he was aware of Rusty. Your dad got a, a message from about Rusty. Yes, from what he texted me, he got a message from a, a woman that he was dating, apparently. So the girlfriend of Rusty? Yes. This is S. Fair 6. I tendered yesterday. Um, it's in evidence, and I want to go to... Do you remember talking or texting with your dad exactly what the language was about Rusty? I would have to see... Let's kind of kind of recap my mind. Look, look at uh, S6, and for the record, I retender it back into evidence. But this is number 23. It's your dad's cell from him to you. It's October 20, 2017, at 9:19 a.m. Do you see that? Yes, sir, I do. Dad sent you a text. Read that into the record for us, please. The girlfriend of her boyfriend, Rusty Bar Barton, sent me several disturbing emails last night. She is spending spending a dime of my money. Okay. 
and go down to the next message, 24. From your dad to you, October 20, 2017. What does your dad's message to you say? Things will change dramatically. You need to pursue a job soon. That was in October of 2017, I believe. Yes, sir. Scott, I want you to look at the jury and answer this question. Did you murder your father? I absolutely did not murder my father. Without a doubt, I loved him. Look at me. Do you have anything to do to help your mother dispose of and burn your father? Absolutely not. Tell me, not me. No. Like I said, I love my father. He was the backbone. He was the glue to our family. Hey, it's time to take a break. Take 15 minutes. An emotional Scott Ferris on the stand. We're going to bring in Josh Schiffer to talk about what we have been watching. Josh, do you believe him? You know, I, I, I spoke with Vinny the other night when I when I was on his show about how everybody thought this case was going to be so straightforward, and you know there was no other person that would have a reason, and this was just an up and down case. No. It's so easy, just like the defense said in their opening, to talk about confirmation bias. And we want the stories that our brain comes up with to make a lot of sense. And it's an easy uh, computation. It's an easy equation to see how this couple, uh, if there was going to be a death, how it was going to be mom being so separated, being so estranged, all these other relations, all these financial issues. But now that we're getting into it, there's a giant defense. There's tremendous reasonable doubt as to what happened. And I think the defense is doing a really good job with this deeply emotional testimony, a testimony that is authentic. There's no doubt this young man loved his dad. Uh, and the loss, even if we don't know the motivation, even if we don't know exactly what happened, that loss is real. Uh, and I think that the jury has a lot to think about as we wrap up the first week of what's going to be a bit of a lengthy trial. Josh, what do you make of the uh, prosecution having the witness look at the jury and tell them? And he said to him, don't look at me, tell them. Uh, you know, if it's done right with authenticity, if it's natural, if it's not contrived, if it's not a trick, uh, it's really effective, and, and I think the state did a very good job with it because by highlighting that physical action, when we as people are uh, experiencing stimuluses, when we're hearing information, seeing information, the more you combine all that, the more it encodes into your brain. So the state is doing something very smart in combining actions with words, with emphasis by making him turn his head, by looking at the jury, by telling everyone consciously what's happening, the state's doing a good job in planting and encoding, I didn't kill my father, as an emphasized statement in the minds of the jury, which is good. They need to do that. The state needs to eliminate as much as possible any opportunity that the two sons would have been involved in murdering their father. But the defense is doing a very good job not calling out and saying, oh, here's your motivation. But say when we look at that cross-examination yesterday and the ending moment, the mic drop 
about who would financially benefit from the death of mom. That reasonable doubt is powerful. It's not that mom couldn't have. It's not that mom didn't maybe have a reason to. It's, are you afraid, juror, that if you convict her, you did the wrong thing? Yeah. Well, the cross-examination of Scott should be interesting to watch. Josh Schiffer, thank you so much.